Uh, just want to thank Chicago Humanities Festival for having us. Um, when they first got in contact with me about doing an emoji panel, I was like, are you sure? And I was like, okay, oh, it's kind of about style. So um, it's been really fun kind of thinking about this. And um, Jen and I have been friends for years and kind of knew each other in emoji terms, but also just professional terms. And I'm really happy to be here. Likewise, thank you guys for coming. Um, so I'm gonna have some notes on my phone. I'm not checking Twitter, I promise. Um, I just wanna make sure we cover everything. Uh, I thought I'd kind of start with like a kind of quick overview of the history of emoji. Um, you know, I see some people with like emoji attire on, so you may know this already, but for those of you <laughs> who don't, I, I, I almost wore my emoji shirt today, but I was like, that's, that's too much. Um, uh, so for those of you who don't know, emoji are a actually a standard that's part of a, uh, uh, a standard set called Unicode. Uh, Unicode is a way for operating systems to agree on the way to render fonts. So everything from the letter A to you know uh, accent on the letter E, um, it's all kind of controlled and standardized by this volunteer nonprofit organization called Unicode. Emoji didn't start with Unicode. Um, it started with a Japanese carrier called Docomo uh, in 1999. Um, and uh, the person who actually created the original set was, uh, I hope I get his name right, Shigitaka Kurita. And uh, he was kind of tasked with coming up with something interesting for, um, I guess you could call them like proto smartphones in Japan in the late 90s. Um, and so he kind of like hand did this set and there were 12 pixel by 12 pixel little icons that kind of became popular at the time. And so they blew up in Japan and became this like um, part of like communications culture there. And the other handset manufacturers um, started competing and they all kind of ended up with their own uh, standard set of emoji that were kind of like compatible, but some of them didn't mean the same things across the thing. Uh, around 2007, uh, Google uh, was interested in being able to render these emoji that were coming over in email in Gmail. So Google's product Gmail needed some way to like kind of understand what these icons were and render them like in line in the message. Um, so a guy named Mark Davis at Google started kind of getting into the weeds on this and, and realizing that this is like kind of a complex problem because you have these like hundreds of different icons that kind of came from Japan and suddenly there's like three different handset manufacturers that are all kind of competing with like different versions of a smiley face or a crab or like whatever. And uh, he realizes because he's part of Unicode that this could actually be a Unicode uh, standard if they put it into um, uh, kind of like an official proposal, um, this would be a way to solve these kind of like incompatibility issues across uh, phones. And especially if they were gonna get into Android operating system and like Apple had released the iPhone at that point or announced it and there was like clear potential there. It turned out somebody had actually already thought about this way back in 2000. Um, uh, a developer for an operating system called Symbian had been had seen Japanese emoji uh, and been like, Unicode, maybe you guys wanna think about this. And they're like, no, 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 this is, this is too weird, like we're not gonna take it seriously, but sure enough, 2007, uh, it gets proposed as an official Unicode standard, which says, okay, here's a list of all the icons, here are their names, and then uh, like here's how the operating system should kind of like handle rendering them. So Apple then incorporates it, um, and it kind of is available for Japanese versions of the iPhone. Um, and this is where kind of my story comes in. Um, this is uh, my, one, of my, one of my best friend's uh, wife is Japanese, and so he, he one day just sent me a text message with an emoji, and this is like late 2008, and I'm like, what is this? How did you get inside the iPhone, right? Because the iPhone is like so locked down, and it's like this like the proprietary Apple thing, and like how did you get this icon in there? Um, and he told me you had to download this like Japanese app, and it would kind of like awaken the iPhone to an emoji uh, character keyboard, and I was like, this is amazing. So I started writing like full sentences in emoji, and my brother and I kind of like, um, started writing these things back and forth, and I mean that's that's kind of how I got introduced and obsessed. Um, I can tell I can talk a little bit about the books I worked on, but why don't you jump in and kind of tell your story around that same time and how you heard about them? Yeah, exactly. The same thing happened to me. A friend, I was so I was so because I'm a technology reporter and I pride myself on knowing kind of what the new new is and what the new thing is, and so someone texted me the cartoon emoji, and I was initially really angry because I was sad that I hadn't figured it out first, and then. Yes. 
went online and figured out how to download it myself and then immediately just started texting everyone I knew with the, like the little characters and then not telling anyone else how to get it. Which <laughs> <laughs> that was totally my thing too. I was like, I'm not going to tell you. You're just yeah. going to have to put up with me sending you emoji. <laughs> yeah, and it took off. It became this thing that people were really excited about. And it was really, it, that was really fun because I feel like at that moment, you know, the iPhone was becoming pretty mainstream and it, its adoption had sort of escalated in North America at least and most people had those devices. So, or, or a lot of people were, were getting those devices and so we were able to text each other and spend much more time talking back and forth but like the ways we were able to talk were really limited so there was something really exciting about all of a sudden having this new visual style and this new way to punctuate and this new way to express tone and emotion. And I think that's why they took off. And at first it was kind of like, oh, these are this, this is like this kind of silly, you know, these like silly um, cartoons people are texting. And it was, and I remember when I was pitching, I pitched a big story on emoji to the New York Times and it would have been like, you know. 2009 maybe? No, later, because I think it yeah. was like 10, okay. maybe late 2010. But, but uh, you know, the pushback was like, well, why does anyone care? And I was sort of like, well, this is how culture begins. Like, this is how a new type of culture starts to take shape and to sort of dismiss it as being kind of a silly um, hobby or pastime is sort of dismissing kind of the way humans just naturally create and want to connect and communicate. And there is this very rich, as Fred pointed out, this very rich history in Japan um, around using emojis to talk and sort of what that means. So it was it was really interesting. And I, it's funny now to be like six years later, we're still obsessed with emoji in North America and, and around the world. It's kind of phenomenal. I, I keep on waiting for the hype cycle just to like hit the wall and just be like, all right, there'll be, some like, there'll be some like VH1 special, remember emoji. <laughs> 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 but it hasn't happened yet, and we're still kind of in the thick of it, which is amazing to me. Um, yeah, so around that time, I you know, was writing, trying to write full sentences in emoji and um, was experimenting with just kind of like weird computer projects and um, uh, had kind of gotten familiar with this service called Mechanical Turk, uh, which is this Amazon uh, back-end thing that you, you can use to hire people to do interesting little tasks for like 20 cents a task or something. And so I was like fascinated that you could just like, you could you could put up a request on the internet and pay, you know, this small amount to get like thousands of little things done for you. Um, and I was like trying to come up with like interesting, weird things. This was at the same time I was thinking about emoji. And I was like, I should write a book in emoji. I'm like really into this. I could probably write a whole book. And I was like, I don't want to do that. That's like a lot of time. And like, I'm, I, I'm not a fiction writer, who knows? I was like, maybe I can translate a book uh, and and like something that's in the public domain that's like just like like really crazy. That's like impossible to put into emoji. Like like what would be like what would be this weird like pushing the idea way too far idea. And first I thought about the Bible, but like that seemed kind of obvious. And then I was like, what's like what's like the best literature in the public domain that I can download right now and try to translate an emoji? And I was like, oh yeah, Moby Dick's in the public domain. And like I had kind of like, you know, enough experience with the book that I was like, this is gonna be weird. So I was like, okay, I'm not gonna translate this. I'm gonna hire people to translate this. And I'm gonna give them the little emoji palette and they'll just have to go sentence by sentence and we'll see what this does. So I put on like the first chapter on Mechanical Turk and it came back and like, I think the first line was that call me Ishmael thing where it was like telephone, like sailboat, whale, and like man face. And I was like, this is really good. I was like, it's kind of amazing. This like, this like, pressure to be creative with like this limited palette it it speaks to like the nature of creativity right like you only have a set of like colors to work with and suddenly you have to try to like make this like really incredible thought with with this palette and so I did the math and I was like wait if I want to do the whole book this is gonna be like thousands of dollars and I was like okay this is a fun experiment I kind of put it in the back of my mind six months later is actually when I met Jenna I think this is like late 2009 um Kickstarter had launched as a company and I was talking to the guys about other things uh, and I met somebody there and they're like, you should put emoji dick on Kickstarter. And I was like, that's a great idea. I was like, if I get the crowd to pay for the crowd to translate, then I'm just like this weird man behind the scenes orchestrating this like insane translation project. Um, and so I did it, only 83 people backed the project and like I was just, I barely hit the goal. I think it was a lot of my friends and family just like indulging me on this like insane idea. And I spent a year working on this. I had to teach myself how to like format the book and I had to like get all the data right. And it was like this really complex data project. Um, but it, I did it, and I shipped the book to people, and it became this like slow boil where people were like, oh yeah, you're the guy that did Emoji Dick, and I was like, yeah, how do you know about that? They're like, well, every you know, like Emoji is a thing, and I was like, yeah, I guess so, and they're like, you you did it so early, and like that I have that conversation like weekly still, and so in 2013, 
I got an email from the Library of Congress, and they're like, we'd like to acquire Emoji Dick. And I was like, are you sure you know what this is? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We want, we want it to be the first Emoji book in the Library of Congress. And I was like, OK, let's talk about this. And so I get on the phone, and it's totally legit. And I was like, I cannot believe this is happening. So I send them a copy, and like, like I get the certificate. And I'm talking to a friend, David Gallagher, actually, and, and is a mutual friend of ours. And, and he's like, you know, anybody can submit anything to the Library of Congress. You know that, right? I was like, no, no, they asked for it. And it's the first emoji book there. So. <laughs> So I wrote it up and it became like this crazy story and then it, it was more like the, the hype cycle hasn't died and so I would eventually try to build an emoji translation engine and um, I kind of got I got some more attention that way and I, I ended up with another book thing with uh, eBerry Press which is a uh, imprint of UK, uh, Random House, uh, Penguin Random House in the UK and I, I wrote a book literally called How to Speak Emoji which is kind of like a fun humor book. It's going to be out in the in the fall in, in America um, and you know, the, the waves keep coming. So that's, that's kind of like awesome. my weird book projects of emoji. Um, well, let me, let me ask you a quick question, Fred. I mean, why do you think, because you're, t okay, you're talking about 2009, early, early, early days. And even when I wrote the emoji story, it was like way before, I mean, for yeah. the New York Times, yeah. it was way before people really started to adopt and use and like have these deep philosophical discussions about the future of language because we were using emoji. But why do you think it's had such stickiness? Like, why do you think it's resonated as much as it has? And why are people still obsessed with your project? I, 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 did, I guess I didn't really think about this until recently when I started having these conversations. I'm like, yeah, it has been a couple of years of like thinking about this. I'm like, okay, so why? Um, I think it's, it has to do with how much text we use every day to communicate with each other. And it's actually a consequence of us needing something a little bit more than what reading and writing can give us, right? When we're communicating with each other, using messages all the time, um, how do we convey that little extra bit of emotion or nuance or subtlety or humor uh, that, that's not just the written literal word, I'm using that word properly. Um, and uh, uh, I think emoji kind of rose to the occasion where it's like if I just want to do something like kind of absurd and winky, like I, I now have a whole nother palette to do that that's not text. And so we, we then, uh, we love it for that reason. I think yeah. it, it allows this degree of freedom we normally didn't have with text. So mm -hmm. that's, my, that's my philosophical explanation. <laughs> that's great. So one, one thing I have in my notes, uh, I, I don't know if you want to get to something, yeah. it's just real quick, what, what are your favorite emoji? Um, oh gosh, like historically favorite or current favorite? We, we talked about this, you had so much time <laughs> to prepare. <laughs> well no, I thought about that because my all-time fave emojis are like, you know, the kind of muscle emoji because it kind of, it says so much and it's like, it's such a good one word response to like any, any time you're in a hurry or you don't have time to respond, like it's like, be strong. It's, yeah, be, be strong or like get it or like, ha, you know what I mean? Like I'm with you, like it's the perfect, you know, like all purpose response. Yeah. But I don't know, it's funny because I was thinking about, I've been, whenever I look, I'll look at my um, most recently used emojis and I realize that that kind of can be almost like a, like a horoscope for my life at the moment or whatever, whatever, whatever I'm totally. going through where like it can be a good aura reading for myself in a weird way. And I was looking at it this week and it's like tornado, <laughs> obviously like the lemonade emoji because of Beyonce's lemonade, the taco and like a fish cake. And it's, it's funny because I look at those and it's like I don't really text and talk to my friends about food, but it's just, they're a funny stand. Like I have a friend who loves to use the, the fish cake emoji as like the Kanye shrug for some reason. Like that's her like, that's that's what it is for her. And it's weird, it's got this strange, it's imbued with this very strange meaning. But, but yeah, I don't know, I've been swept up in a lot of really exciting emotions and new opportunities and things. So the tornado is like, I guess it could be, you know, I guess it could be an actual calamity, you know, if there's like a, I don't know. But for me, it just means like things are happening, things are exciting, you know, and so. Right now, that's my favorite emoji, but historically, it's not. You it's, know, it changes for me too. I mean, I, I I thought I had a favorite one, and then I realized I got obsessed with the uh, Easter Island head emoji. Um, and and it, if you have the iPhone app, it just kind of showed up one day. And you're like, why is this in here? Like like, surely emoji have to be used commonly enough to like make it in to the cut here. Like, why is there an Easter Island head? Who's who's traveling to Easter Island? Is like, I'll meet you by the Easter Island head. Y you know what I'm talking about? It's like the big stone face, right? Um, and so one day I was like, I gotta look into this. And the emoji is called Moyai, M-O-Y-A-I. And that's not actually what they're called in Easter Island. It's just the name of the sculpture um, that's actually in downtown Tokyo. And it turns out it's in next to Shinjuku Station. It's where Japanese teenagers used to meet up. And so it's actually one of these great examples of how much influence like Japanese 
telephones have had on emoji is that it kind of ended up in their texting culture because it was an easy place to meet. And like the, the, the carriers there were like, we can't not have the you know, Moyai head in there. So when Android used, uh, incorporated, made the image for that, they actually made it look very much like the statue in Tokyo. And it doesn't even look like an Easter Island head. It turns out the statue is just inspired by the Easter Island head. And like the artist who made the statue in Tokyo said that, that was his inspiration. But when Apple decided to make the emoji, they were like, we're just going to go back to the root and we're just going to make it look like the Easter Island head. And, the, and, and it, that's why it was in the travel section was like it was a place to meet up. And so now they've moved it out of the travel section to some other section that's like miscellaneous, basically. And like, I just love that one because it's so obscure. And like, like you're just like if you just I use it in like vaguely like 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 pray to the heavens sort of scenarios where I'm just like, just let's, let's hope, let's, let's like hope some God out there <laughs> like, like help, helps us out with the, uh, with the spirits or something. Do you know the story behind the cat in the lion costume? No. I remember that was your, one of your faves for oh, a while. Yeah, that it's was. like a cat, it, the cat looks so sad. Yeah. It's, like a, it's like a house, like a pet. They, a they added a lion emoji recently and he's got this little mane around it, but he really just looks like the cat face with like a little lion thing around it. And it turns out there's a, costume on the internet that like you just put on your cat and it looks it makes him look like a little <laughs> lion and that's actually what that emoji looks like it doesn't look like a lion anymore yeah. but um anyway to, to go back to your point about the kind of vagaries uh, this really ties well into the language thing um what do you think it is like about emoji that and and like the conversation around language that makes it possible to even take it seriously as a language like like what is it a language? Like, what's your opinion there? And then, like, I think that there's this really interesting thing we can push on about the the vagueness of emoji um, and why that's useful. I think the ambiguity of emoji makes it a strong case for being a language. Oddly enough, I think because it, it is so um, susceptible to our own interpretation, it is so susceptible susceptible to our own individualization in a way. Like, we can customize it, and it it is. You know, there are standards around what emojis are available to us, but, you know, we're, we're able to build our own, um, you know, grammatical structures. We're able to build our own system of semantics around it. And I think that, to me, makes it sort of a different kind of language than we've seen before. But I also feel like there's something really, really, really exciting about it being a modern language that we can that we can we can tailor to our own needs and communities and different cultures and cultural experiences. And I think, you know, I remember when... Um, when the brand started using emoji in their subject line, and I was like, this is clever as shit. Like, this yeah. makes me open the emails, you yeah. know? And it's like, there is something about, there. there is a, emoji, being able to use emoji well suggests a savviness that doesn't come from necessarily having a good grasp of, of grammatical structure of the English language, you know? It's like, yeah. there is something really different and unique about it that makes me feel like it's its own language. Yeah, it's definitely like a separate skill set, and it's activating some part of your brain of like, okay, how do I express myself given these like baseline kind of, palette, whether they're letters or they're images. Um, so, and we're beginning to see a little bit of this, right? Like, you can use emoji literally very easily, right? Like train or like whatever, I'm going to the train. Um, but then, like a lot of emoji, like Jenna was saying, are kind of taking on these secondary meanings. Like the eggplant one, I think, is the most notorious, right? Like it's like very Notorious. Clear. Notorious. <laughs> Just suggestive. <yeah. laughs> Just suggestive, maybe, that's a better word. Um, <laughs> But it turns out Unicode is confronted with this question all the time, just like I am, like, is emoji a language? Like, can you actually turn it into a language? And Unicode is like, no, it, here's, here's what a language is, here's why emoji is not that, like, you're gonna have to take our word for us, but you know, we're still working with it, but we don't consider it a language because um, there's just too, like, there's not enough like abstract like concepts in it. And like, it's too hard to kind of identify thoughts and these like kind of complex topics. Um, but my opinion is like, we're not quite there yet. And if we see more grammar and syntax kind of build up around it, where there's an expectation to use an emoji in this way, or, or you know, it turns out when you use this emoji in that way, uh, it actually means this very like complex abstract thing that you would normally not be able to convey with emoji. We're gonna get there. I mean, people, millions of people are using these things every hour of the day we're gonna see that kind of evolution happen. And like Jenna said, it's kind of like ours to define it. It's like mm -hmm. very interesting to see um, the kind of like natural order pick these things up. And, and, and there's, no, there's no academy saying like, this is how emoji has to be used. And right. that's like why, why it's probably so fun too. Yeah, it's exciting because it feels, I mean, it, it just feels like a new, it feels very, it feels something very like of a generation, which is totally intergenerational. There's no like set age category. I feel like that does or doesn't use emoji, it's totally personal and yeah. it, it's completely spans um, 
do you yeah we were just talking about how like moms seem to be like the biggest adopters and like quickest adopters and emoji and my like my mom is amazing at emoji she's like better than I am at emoji <laughs> and and uh it's been fascinating because my, my dad like barely gets it. Like I've seen yeah. him use it like once. I mean, I think there's something really compelling too about how much how much fun they are. Yeah. And it's like it's it's they're functional. They make interacting more efficient. Like it's much easier if you're rushing to the subway and you don't want to drop your phone. Just like tap out, like yeah. find the train emoji and yeah. train yeah. before you go underground. Like I do there, that all the time. There's that, but there's also something really compelling about just it. Just makes our interactions that much more fun. And we are communicating way much more, like way more over these devices. We are limited to using text only, mm -hmm. you know, in a lot of our interactions. And I think there's something not to be overlooked in just sort of how much more entertaining it makes it and, and the value of that um yeah, I, yeah. I, it reminds me of this uh study that somebody did where they found that when you look at an image or like an icon or a little cartoon of somebody smiling it's actually triggering the same part of your brain that's getting triggered when you see somebody smile in real life and it turns out this is not the case for like emoticons like a colon with a dash and a parentheses like that kind of works but like emojis are more evocative and mm -hmm. and this actually scales into a lot of other areas of culture um, you may have heard of something called the uncanny valley which is like as um, as uh, images and cartoons get more and more realistic they actually become more disturbing to some people. It, it's just a theory about how people interpret like like 3D graphics. Um, but the kind of recommendation is that if you make characters more cartoonish, they're actually more capable of holding emotion and better at conveying it because there are parts of our brains that are specifically designed and kind of like cultured to do that. And this is why if you look at a movie like Toy Story, um, like in the early days, that was all they could really do. The, the, the human figures uh, didn't look good. So they made the movie about these kind of cartoonish faces and, and those, those came in the form of toys. And so I think emoji kind of like tap into that same thing where, you know, the heart, the, the face with heart eyes is like incredibly evocative, right? Like, like you use that one, it like really means something. Mm -hmm. And yet it's like, you know, 60 pixels inside your phone, but like you can convey a lot more with that little thing, emotionally speaking, than you can with maybe a couple sentences, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So like, is that language or is it something else, right? Like I, I would say that that's like this, in this weird zone of like almost poetry or like creative writing that's like, you know, the way, the way a poet might use a word in the way it's not supposed to, but it, it evokes something that's much more deep and interesting because of its context and the way you, that you're reading the work. Um, so I have another note for um, another topic that's like super interesting that I'm sure some of you have kind of thought about in the audience and, and kind of encountered, which is the politics of emoji. And, and I think that there are kind of three different places where these things crop up. Um, one is uh, with uh, the flags and emoji. Um, originally there was just like 13 flags and like, you know, people who like, whose country wasn't represented in that were like, wait, why can't I use my my country in my phone, like that's like a big deal. Um, and Unicode kind of saw this coming. And so Unicode actually decided to punt on this in a really smart way. Um, they built a system where you combine two letters to represent a country and then the operating system has to decide which flag to show. So in Unicode, they just say, we have these letters like C and N and if you send those together, that will mean China, and it's up to the operating system to show that flag. So we're not actually deciding which countries are in the Unicode emoji set, because that's too political, it turns out, because China doesn't want Taiwan in there, and like you can imagine how much more complicated that gets down the line. So it's actually up to Apple to decide which flags are in your phone and which aren't. And it just gives you a little bit of the tip of the iceberg of how political these things can get. And, and Unicode kind of figured out a decent solution there and eventually kind of opened it up to this like much bigger like palette of like there's just too many flags in there now. Um, although there is a really good one. My favorite one is the Antarctica one. Um, I don't think Antarctica is technically a country, but they have a flag in the emoji set. It's the, it's a, at the beginning, it's like a blue one with a little white island in there, or white continent. Um, <laughs> Um, but then there's the food component, right? And you think, oh, food's fun, but their original emoji set had mostly Japanese food in it. It didn't have cheese, it didn't have hot dogs. Like, I think it had a slice of pizza, but uh, uh, there's like three or four things that you might get at a traditional Japanese meal that you're like, I don't even know what this is. And like, I love Japan, and like, I kind of recognize that stuff, but like, I'm like, wait, this is taking the place of cheese? <laughs> and, and it turns out like people feel very strongly about this. And there was actually an article about uh, a group in Chicago, I don't know if you're here, it'd be amazing, uh, that petitioned for 
the hot dog to join emoji. And that was one of the first like, like user developed petitions was from Chicago for the hot dog. And now it's, it joined emoji like a couple versions ago. So they, they were able to do that. But the real one, the real political issue is people, right? And skin tone. And like, this is something we've talked a lot about and like, it's fascinating to see how they tried to fix it. Um, what are your thoughts on that? I mean, do you use the skin tones? I mean, of course. oh my God, I, it was you, so exciting. I know you yeah, do. Yeah, it was so yeah. exciting. I mean, it was, it was really interesting to sort of see the kind of the desire for people to to be able to represent themselves like i'd always been thinking of emoji as kind of this character set it's like everyone looks like bart simpson like it's not really it's not a political thing like it's just a very generic set of characters that we use but then i think as the adoption kind of scaled and grew people felt really strongly like i you know just like you know i want to be able to talk about the hot dog i mean there you know i would i'd like to be able to use the dumpling or i want to be able to use like a glass of wine or whatever that people started to really they wanted to be able to project themselves in their own narratives and i think that really speaks to how much we do identify with how much we're talking about ourselves and how we're talking about our lives and our lifestyles over text whether it's through gmail or imessage or an android you know it's like we're we're really living through these screens and through these devices and so it, it just became of you know tantamount importance to be able to talk about yourselves in a very very authentic way and so i was sort of very neutral but like seeing people on twitter and seeing people around the internet really pushing unicode to release a more varied skin tone palette and also a, a much more varied family palette and sort of the th and thinking through you know and at first i was neutral on it and then i kind of came around thinking like it actually it actually matters if we're talking about something that is a language or if we're talking about something that sort of starts to resemble art or a piece of poetry what does it mean when that only speaks to one experience or one person's version of life? Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned the, the family one because that was one of the first evolutions that Unicode did was that they, they included uh, like, I don't know, like gendered couples, right? Like originally it was just a man and a woman holding hands, but then they actually very quickly added a man and a man holding hands and a woman and a woman holding hands. Um, and that was really important for a lot of people um, to, to see that representation in there. And you're thinking like, oh, this is such a minor thing, but like, it hurts when you don't have representation in there. And, and as, um, you know, as somebody who grew up in American culture, I felt like a very small version of that when emoji didn't have like the taco or cheese or like these favorite foods of mine. Or, uh, and, and, and I can only imagine when it's something that's so much more core to your identity that's not being represented in this thing. You're just like, well, it's just another example of how like, you know, like there's a, there can be a very real systemic bias baked into software. Um, yeah. And I think it's a, it's a fascinating topic that people can overlook. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 I wanted to also touch on the skin tone stuff. Um, Emoji did something really interesting there, or Unicode did something really interesting there with uh, Emoji, where they came up with a kind of a, an accepted uh, a range of skin tones that's actually based on something called the Fitzpatrick scale, uh, which is like an anthropologically accepted set of like tones that represent people's skin. And what they now do is that the way it works is that it actually sends the skin tone character and then the emoji, and then the operating system has to combine them two to, to show like the right skin tone in there. And so uh, there's like this like interesting kind of software trick that happens where if your phone isn't up to date with that, you'll actually just get a, like a brown block and then like and then like a, a, a face. Um, and and you know, as somebody who like doesn't have a lot of skin tone, uh, I've always felt conflicted about <laughs> about using it because I'm like it feels weird to me to choose the white skin tone. Like it's I, I mean maybe that's just speaking from a place of privilege. Like I, I I'm not I'm not used to like choosing a skin tone in that way. So I always default to the Bart Simpson skin tone because I like I'm, I don't want to I feel icky about making a decision there. But you know like I'm curious what your interactions with people there have been or like how how you felt about other people using that in context I mean yeah no I think I mean at least among my friends like my various circles people were really excited to be able to not have to use yeah. a yellow skin tone that also felt maybe politically you know bogged down as well like what does it mean to for yellow skin tone and we know that these that this character set comes from Japan like is there yep, something inherently you know racist about that and like uh, you know I think people felt there was just it was a there was a lot of meaning there for people yeah. who do spend their time thinking about what skin tones mean and what it does mean to sort of not see yourself represented like how are we supposed to then interpret this default as well and so I think it, th there was this sort of big I mean I saw it ripple across the internet but this giant like wave of relief and excitement yeah. that people could then and not only like represent themselves but use emoji to sort of tell much more nuanced and much more dynamic um, stories and yeah. you could sort of talk about 
two different friends in the same conversation by indicating who they were yeah. with using different skin tones, and there was something exciting about that. But you brought up something that I thought was really fascinating, was that we got the skin tones, but all the facial structures are the same. Yeah. And that actually probably skirts a much more dicier issue yeah. for Unicode or, or the operating systems yeah. or then the phone carriers where they right. have to think about, like, how will people interpret these different facial structures, right. and if there's something weird about that. But I did have an interesting experience where... I was with some friends of mine who were white, and I could see on their phones that they'd been having a conversation using the darkest tone emojis, and it was very interesting, because oh, wow. I didn't, it never occurred to me that people might use them disparagingly, or, or use them in a way that was sort of not politically correct, and I, and I don't know what they were talking about, but I, I definitely was like, oh my gosh, that's well, actually kind of intense to see. And even if they were just telling a story about two black people, it's still like interesting, right? Like, and, and, you know, we're, emoji has this very emotive, evocative thing, and then you throw in race, and suddenly you're like, you're like, wow, I could really offend somebody if I choose the wrong emoji. And so, like, like, you know, you're imagine you're texting with a friend, and they're not your race, and you want to reference them in emoji. Do do you make the decision about what skin tone they are in your phone? And you're like, I hope I sent the right, you know, darkness there. But at least you're trying, right? I mean, like, like, like I, I think I give a, I, I give Unicode a lot of credit for for getting on this. They actually turned that stuff around within like a year or two. I agree, um, and it, it also happened. In, if you think about it too, it happened in 2012, yeah, 13. Right. Yeah. It happened at a time too when we started to really deal with race much more actively in our country, mm -hmm. and I feel like that alone says a lot because it sort of became this thing that wasn't by default. It wasn't. Right. It wasn't you know, it wasn't yellow by default or right. post-racial by default. It sort of became this thing that we were able to actually really engage with. And I just, I, I can't overexpress how much, how important I think that actually is for people who are living through their screens and want to see themselves and they want to see themselves in the communication that they're having with each other. Another, another kind of interesting thing that came up with that is just the hair color choice. And so now you can kind of choose hair color on a lot of emoji. And two, two things I noticed that were interesting on there were, um, there's an emoji called person with blonde hair. And you can actually make that person like very darkly colored skin and so that they basically look black, but then they, their hair still stays blonde because that's the Unicode standard. And so it just reminds me of Dennis Rodman. And so I, I don't know if it's politically correct, but that- No, people were excited know, by yeah, that because yeah, they're definitely black yeah. people who have blonde hair. And yeah, it was very, totally. like that was awesome. Yeah. But then on the flip side of that though, it's if you use the bride emoji or the princess emoji and you want to choose the darkest palette and you know, but the eyes stay blue. And so there's something also yeah. really very Toni Morrison, you know, dystopian, yeah the strange about that and I and I again it's like it's the weird limitations of this standard and the software set that was built many years ago but at the same time I really push back against seeing like oh well it's the limitations of the software no it's the limitation of the people who designed it like they weren't ever thinking and they should have been about how something like this might be adopted and I and I think we sort of tend to treat you know these kind of strange flaws or biases in software is kind of beyond our capabilities to fix or change, and it's that's it's as though acting is like an, an otherworldly entity, like God created it. No, we made it. Like man made it, humans made it, women made it. You know, and we can change it. And I think that sort of pretending that these nuances don't matter is actually a microcosm of sort of how we tend to treat these larger political and racial and social issues anyway. And so thinking about emoji is endlessly fascinating because it does become this strange, it's not a silly hobby, it's not like a silly, you know, pastime. It actually becomes on a very sort of tiny scale these other issues that we're dealing with and haven't really figured out how to talk about. Yeah, and, and they're just going to get more complicated. Um, you know, I want to shift to, to understanding emoji as this kind of like a limited set, which is a important thing to understand, um, because it's a standard, all the phones have to agree with it. So like there's a finite number of emoji you can fit in there. So you have this vast spectrum of human experience and body types and hair types and like everything. And, and, and you wanna be able to convey that in an emoji, but yet you only have a number of slots to do it in. And you can do some kind of hack like the flag one where you're, you're, you're kind of like sending these characters, but then you're kind of just like falling back to, to like this other system, um, and you can kind of, and, and there's also this this thing that they figured out where if they want to show um, families, you can do like any combination of families basically now, right? Like, you know, uh, two fathers and two daughters, or like, and, and, and that was like another hack that Unicode and Apple kind of worked together on, so you can actually send that as a single character. Um, so they're trying to figure out these ways to kind of like broaden the experience, but at the end of the day, it's, it's kind of a burden for Unicode to, to go through all this stuff, and they didn't really even anticipate this, right? They, they, they kind of agreed that like, you know, Unicode might be the place to put like this 
symbolic set, and there's actually a lot of history with things like uh, wingdings, I'm sure you guys remember that, or older font called Zap Dingbats. Um, those, are, those are kind of icons that made themselves in, uh, made their way into computer printers in the 70s and 80s um, that versions of them kind of actually eventually would end up into emoji. Um, and so um, Unicode was kind of like open to this idea of like having these, these symbolic characters in their system, but they had no idea this was gonna be what they were known for, right? Like, if you've heard of Unicode, it's probably because you've heard of emoji anymore. Before that, it, they were just like, are, you know, like trying to decide Cyrillic fonts or, or you know, these, these kind of like arcane parts of uh, font operating systems. Um, and so now they're in the hot seat and they're trying to make these decisions that they're doing a good job on, whether it's about skin tone or, or, or flags or food or whatever, um, but it's a finite list. And um, if you go through their website now and you kind of look at where things are going, they anticipate that they're gonna be releasing 60 new emoji a year, uh, which is actually kind of a lot. And uh, I kind of wanted to end on the kind of future of emoji and like kind of where uh, where we see it's going. Um, but I'll start with a list of, um, of, uh, of emoji that are coming out towards the end of the year that you guys can look for that we kind of picked out. Um, avocado, bacon, uh, Mother Christmas, um, and then uh, the call me hand, which I actually surf, so like it's a it's a shaka for surfing, which I'm excited about. I think Jenna had picked out um, black heart, uh, uh, wilted flower. Uh, so goth, like I love it. Like I love that you can just like if someone's like, "How's your day?" and wilted rose. Like I love, or like, "How was your date?" Black heart. Like I love it. It makes me so happy. And then shrug is going to be a big one. So so those are the new emoji that are that, that, that's a subset of like the hundred plus emoji that are coming. I think by the end of the year. Um, but it, Unicode is basically like, this is unsustainable. And at one point we have to kind of get into like new territory where people are including inline images and you can just choose whatever image you want as like kind of a modifier of your text. And 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 that's kind of where these conversations have been leading when Jenna and I have been talking over this, uh, the last couple of months. It's just like the future like post emoji world, like what does that look like? And, and Jenna has been thinking a lot about that. We've also been using different like gift systems and that kind of thing. Do you want to kind of jump? Yeah, in? Yeah, no. I think that I think something really exciting is happening. I think that you know we've sort of gone to this very visual, rich mo like mode of communication, and emoji kind of helped pave the way. But you're right. I mean, thinking about. 60 new emoji next year, like I can barely, I spend way too much time, like, I know you can kind of program short code, like shorthands, for, and I just don't have the time for that, but I like spend so much time like searching for like the tornado gif or, like, or the tornado emoji or like, the, I love the, I'm obsessed with the bathtub emojis, like I love the one where it's like the person in the bathtub and then the even more darker and weird existential like no one's in the bathtub anymore and like I don't, I don't know what either of those mean. A bathtub. It's like relaxing and then just empty and you're like what? Um, and those are really fun too. But so I've been thinking a lot about, so you know, we sort of know that we like, we like things that are evocative, we like things that are emotional, we like, we like sending images or, or things that can convey tone that text can't. Um, and so, you know, you start to see things like Kimoji or like then Amber Rose had her emoji. And both of those are really interesting because they seem gimmicky and brandy and they probably are and they probably do pretend to something really maybe dystopian about the future of advertising and brands coming into our phones even more. But there's also something really interesting about people sort of patenting versions of themselves that people that their fans or followers can then use to talk about them. It, it, there's something strange happening there that's really fascinating. But then you see lots of things like um, eBroji and other uh, types of applications that then open up a GIF keyboard so you can sort of paste a little short moving image into your uh, into your communication. So instead of just sending the shrug emoticon or shrug emoji, you can send a GIF of Prince rolling his eyes. And that is much more communicative than, you know, one simple tiny cartoon character might be. And so there's something really interesting about the, that we're getting into things that are even more 3D and even more varied instead of just sending one particular, you know, cartoon icon. Yeah, I've been thinking a lot about emoji as these kind of like discrete kind of like uh, punctuation marks for our language. And maybe they can kind of turn into their own language. Well, that remains to be seen. But they are, um, uh, they're kind of one-liners in a way, uh, even if you write a full sentence. But when you look at a GIF and it's got like, even if it's just 30 frames of, of a moving image of, of somebody expressing an emotion, suddenly you're, you can convey a very complex thought. And I think a lot of the reason why people like GIFs is because they can't be literally described, right? Like, yeah. it's like you wouldn't be able to convey the kind of sarcasm in Prince rolling his eyes, right? Like you could be, you could kind of get at it, but it would require a lot more text. And when you have yeah. that kind of moment in the context and also the cultural reference that somebody may understand, oh, it's from this movie or oh, it's from this music video, like 
that you're suddenly sending so much more meaning down the pipe. And that's like really a really interesting frontier of communication. So we have a little time at the end for questions, and there will be, um, we have some lovely people who are walking There's around microphone, with microphones, so, uh, so yeah. we just ask if you, um, yeah, raise your hand if you have a question, and then just wait to start talking until you get the mic. There's questions right in the front. Yes, as a virgin to emoji, <laughs> because I really have not worked with them, is there a primer? Or is there some way to get started with it, and is there My any? My book is available on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, okay, it is, okay. and. Is there like a dictionary? You say you've got to scroll through it to find what you want. So there's no, it's not classic, there are no classifications. These are amazing or, questions. These are good questions. Or <laughs> divisions. I, I, yeah, I, it, it, I mean, it looks like a regular alphabet on your, if you're using an iPhone or, or a, another device, there should be, I mean, someone, we could probably show you after, but you know, you can unlock a keyboard that you then, and then just like, you know, that'll show you kind of the range and the, and the palette of, of icons that you can choose from. And I would say just start experimenting, yeah. just like choose what feels good to you. If you're feeling happy, send a happy face. If you're hungry, send, you know, the fork and knife and a question mark and just see. Um, but you know, I would sort of, I would just sort of play around and sort of feel, you know, just kind of feel it out, right? Yeah, totally. And I think the more you are yourself and the less you kind of conform to some standard out there with the emoji, the better. I mean. Uh, I think Amber was telling us about your was it your grand your mother and or, or is, is somebody who's who's like you would you know like you you run in these situations where somebody's just using just totally eccentric emoji and you love them for it and you're just like I love that you, this is your favorite emoji like like you're saying it like her favorite is like the balloons right yeah and like that's that's so charming right it's a, such a thing about her personality so don't feel like you can you'll make a mistake uh, I think one's right here yeah so. Um, I'm not an emoji complete virgin. I, you know, I, I've been known to use the heart. That's pretty... It's a good one. It's a classic. Pretty clear, yeah. And the glass of wine has seen yeah. a substantial amount of use. Um, <laughs> the history of the world and one's personal history is rife with uh, miscommunications. And this medium, this language seems you know, really high risk, uh, high risk. Uh, among other things, I've read that the Microsoft and Apple versions are different, almost like dialects. So you could send something happily from your Mac and what your friend on his PC sees is not quite that face. We're also doing international. You know, we communicate with people in other countries and something that looks clear to an American might not to someone in France or almost anywhere else. I wonder what your comments on that and also perhaps you've had miscommunications in your own life. Maybe you might tell us about some of those that were more spectacular than others. <laughs> I love that. That's I love the way you describe the um, lack of fluency between operating systems as dialects. That's really kind of lovely. I, I don't know. Have you had any crazy? I mean, I've definitely for a long time I didn't know that people use the peach emoji to talk about the butt. Like I didn't know that that's what that the peach is like similar to the eggplant. It's imbued with a lot of of sexual suggestion, which I didn't know. And I love the peach because I just I like peaches and it feels very summery to me. And I would be like. <laughs> peach, 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 like wave, 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 like question mark, and people were kind of like, whoa, that's <laughs> like, that's like, what kind of day are you trying to have? And I'd be like, what? Like, let's go to the beach and eat fruit, you know? And someone's like, oh, that sounds like you're trying to like, you know, have like a very different kind of act active day. And so I guess in that sense, but, I, but in my, my personal experience though, has been that, you know, as phones have gotten bigger and, as, and you know, as I've been sort of more of my life is, ca is caught up sort of in between time, transit, you know, I'm not really able to communicate as thoroughly as I want to. I find that emoji sort of helps soften the, you know, the truncated sort of text that I'm trying to send so that someone knows I'm not angry or I'm not frustrated or I'm not being sarcastic, that there is sort of, so my, my use tends to be much more like, I want you to know that things are copacetic between us and that we're, everything is okay and like, let's get wine later. You know, like that's sort of how I've, how I've sort of used it, but I'm curious yeah, to hear for I, you. I, uh, I f yeah, to take, to take that and turn it into something maybe a little in contrast, I think all language has ambiguity and we're, we're so used to saying ha 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 or lol and like those are such flat responses um, that like those kind of are rife with miscommunication risk, right? And I think I think the way we communicate with each other can be very terse and like, like you know, really being clear with somebody 
over text is like challenging and and in real life communication will always be much higher bandwidth. Um, I think the emoji that I send that is most commonly misinterpreted is the nail paint emoji mm -hmm. because like I don't I don't paint my nails and like people are like why are you sending that emoji but I just for some reason develop that as like oh you're fancy like <laughs> like like <laughs> <laughs> Right, right? But but people were like, why are you sending this to me? And I was like, Whatever. If anything, I mean, you know, we were talking, we, we didn't mention this earlier, but we were talking about this backstage earlier and how, if anything, the miscommunications sort of come from above, from like the governing body that's society. And, like these are the emojis that you have to work with. And it feels very strange that the dancing emoji is a woman. It's always a woman. There's no dancing man. Or like one of the, um, one of the yeah, emojis yeah. that are coming is a pregnant woman. And I, my first response was, well, where's the pregnant man? I mean, that exists. You know, there are, pre there are men who are pregnant. And so, you know, I think that there are these, that we're, com we're compressing and expanding language in really profound and um, uncharted ways. And so within that, there are there tends to be these kind of weird flaws or shortcomings that come along with it. But for the most part, it feels really good natured and yeah, fun. Yeah. yeah. I lost track of who's next. Wow. It's a lot of questions. So it seems like um, the emojis are an attempt to be more precise with your texting, to communicate what you're feeling. Do you think we'll ever go full circle and people will actually communicate with each other? Directly? <laughs> I love to talk on the phone. I'm the number one phone talker. So, <laughs> but. Yeah, no, I feel the same way. I, uh, um, I had an experience with somebody recently where the, I was like, you're not really into texting. And they're like, no. And I was like, all right, well, you just call me. And then it got me back into talking on the phone. And that's been really interesting. There's a great book, if you're interested in this topic, called um, by Sherry Turkle. What's the name of it? Um, Reclaiming Conversation. And uh, she takes a very hard line against uh, the way that text and uh, digital communication can, can, can kind of um, uh, break us away from being present with each other. And, and I agree with it a lot, but I won't go as far as to say that technology is the enemy. I think it can do a lot of precursor work for us to stay in contact and see, you know, oh, Jenna's in Chicago, and maybe I'll drop her a text and say, go see the museum. And like, like yeah, that's not really communicating. You're just like bouncing information between in these like very kind of low bandwidth channels. Um, but uh, I think emoji are kind of, they, they, they make what limited bandwidth we have a little bit better. Um, I've also found too that over time, the more, you know, and I love, I'm a very, very prolific and very active texter. And I've also found that the more time I sort of spend writing things out to my friends, the more I miss them because it's like I want to see their responses and I want to see their faces when I'm telling them some exciting or sad news about my life. And so I've found that even as we've gotten all these more sophisticated ways to sort of talk through our screens, I still want to, you know, I want to hear their voice. And I've, you know, it's it's hard because the, the upside of text and the upside of emoji is that it's asynchronous. So you don't, someone doesn't have to be available when you're available to talk. But I've also gotten really into voice notes, which is really interesting. And I sort of just, if you know, if people know if they're in my inner circle, because I voice note them constantly, because I'm just like, I want you to hear the excitement in my voice when I'm responding to your news that you got a new job. You know, it's like that kind of thing I think will never will never be lacking for that kind of desire for that texture in, in communication. So I'm kind of, agree, I agree with Fred. I think there's there's definitely. Yeah, I think yeah. it's just about being aware of the kind of hierarchy of value in communication and, and being present in, in real life with somebody with your phones turned off and really communicating is always going to be the best. Like we'll never be able to do better than that. And so everything kind of descends from that. And if communication emoji kind of gets you a little bit farther up the ladder then you know, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. It's like survival of their hands. Hi, so this is a question for Fred. Um, how do you explain or justify the fact that your like epistemic authority as an expert on emoji is based on your kind of running, not a digital plantation per se, but like there are all these anonymous people who have actually done this work of translation sure. of the Moby Dick. Right. Who are they? Where does this come from? Like yeah. what are the kind of Economics yeah. and hierarchies. In so, so yeah, I, after I did Emoji Dick, I, I ended up re kind of in the thick of this debate about crowdsourced labor, right? And and I think I think it's a mistake to consider something like Mechanical Turk, which is the Amazon service I use, um, akin to having a job. People may spend a lot of time on there, and a lot of the people who do Mechanical Turk are actually well-educated people who already have jobs, who maybe are not as fulfilled in their day-to-day -day life and just want to, you know, kind of do a, a little bit of a task and get paid a little bit of amount of money for. So I think it's I think it's kind of undermining 
a lot of conversations we've already had about labor to consider it the same thing. On the other hand, there are deeper questions about the kind of identity of the people who work on there, whether they're being treated fairly, whether they're getting paid the right amount for their work, that I think are unanswered. And certain companies are trying to do the right thing there, and we can talk later about that. But in terms of the people who did work on the book, I didn't actually know who they were. They're merely identified by an Amazon, like basically serial number, not to get too dark about it, which is like a unique identifier to them. And I actually put all of those in the back of the book in the acknowledgments. So there's about 800, 900 people who worked on the book and there's like five or six pages of their you know, unique names in the acknowledgments because I, I did want to thank them for their work and I would actually get email, they can contact you um, and they, they would say things like, I really liked working on this, I'd like to do it again. So um, there, was a, there was a good kind of interaction there, but um, we're still kind of figuring out a lot of the kind of mores around crowdsource work online. I have a lot of thoughts, but yeah. This will be our last question. Thank you. My question is also technical a little bit. Um, when you say that um, this has been de developed by Unicode, uh, can you say what Unicode is? Is this an entity? Is this a group of people like the me Mechanical Turf or are there programmers who use Unicode all over the enterprises in Silicon Valley or w what is, where does Unicode? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. Unicode is a uh, nonprofit volunteer-based organization that has members who are programmers in Silicon Valley and so um, they I believe are mostly based in California who work for software companies because they wanted to solve this as a software problem. Um, but they've kind of been opening up uh, the membership and a friend of mine, uh, Jenny Aitley, um, had actually proposed a new emoji, the dumpling emoji, because she thought it was just a complete oversight that emoji never had a dumpling, which is totally true. Um, and she ran a Kickstarter project for it, um, and she actually, I think, is now on the Unicode subcommittee for emoji. So um, they're kind of opening up the ranks, but. Um, yeah, it started off as kind of like a uh, industry standards body. Um, yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. This was a great. Yeah. Thank you, you know, Jenna. The questions were great. So thank you all for coming and for thoughtful questions. <laughs>